Okay, hello friends, it's your instructor Andre Mitash. Today I'm going to discuss a couple of different things you can do with data in the form of text. First we'll touch on very briefly where we can get data in the form of text, as you're probably familiar with. Then we will go over two possible approaches to what we can do with this text. We have three objectives today. First, uh, for you to be able to distinguish between deductive and inductive coding by recalling the features of each one. Second, for you to recall the origins of the grounded theory approach. And finally, most importantly, for you to be able to code a given text according to the procedure of grounded theory. So where can we get data as text? Well, there are of course transcripts of interviews, field notes from observations, text collected with open questionnaires, and also secondary sources like newspaper articles, blogs, and so on. Uh, this lecture assumes that you have already gotten such data or you know how to get it. So you know how to do a good interview or you know how to create participant observation field notes or so on. The general approach to analyzing text is to put the words, phrases, sentences people use and say in some sort of categories. So this doesn't mean putting all the text into some category, by the way, just the text that you find interesting for your research question. There are two very different approaches to making these categories. Basically, you can make up some categories and try to fit the text into them, or you can first look at the text and make up some categories based on patterns that you see there. This first approach where you make up the categories before looking at the text is called deductive coding. Here you as the researcher decide on some categories ahead of time then sort the text into these categories like motivations, experiences. These categories in general uh, the researcher brings from the literature, from some kind of theory you read uh, about that suggests people's uh, motivations or experiences belong in somehow separate categories. The second approach is called inductive coding. Here, you as the researcher create the categories based on patterns that you see within the text. In effect, when you find ideas that seem to come up over and over again in the text, or words that seem particularly important, that people infuse with a lot of meaning, uh, then you put them into, into a category. Like if someone says over and over again that they love a particular city, you might put all these bits of text into the category, loves this city. What's important for you to remember here is that uh, any approach to coding text uh, involves putting bits of text that you find interesting into certain categories. Let's look at an example of deductive coding. Deductive coding again involves putting the text into categories that you, the researcher, have decided on, probably based on uh, some kind of theory, something you've read in the literature, ahead of time. You decide on the categories then you look at the text later. An example of a research project I'm involved in right now that uses deductive coding is a study of people's emotions over the course of a holiday experience. We asked uh, 20 older Americans to keep a diary in which they wrote about how they were feeling every evening of their holiday. These results were typed up and any words referring to emotions or moods during the experience were categorized as positive or negative feelings. In this framework of positive feelings and negative feelings comes from what sort of we as researchers know about emotions. You can see our colleagues at Penn State also made subcategories of the specific emotions that participants wrote about. For example, under positive feelings you have excitement, joy, and contentment. Under negative feelings you have anger, sadness, regret, the key findings from this analysis would be how often and in what context uh, examples of each subcategory occurred. So when did people talk about excitement? When did people talk about anger? And again, these categories were determined more or less 
ahead of time before reading the text based on the emotions that we know to exist from the emotion research literature. Now, let's move on to inductive coding. Here's where we'll spend most of our energy. Again, in inductive coding, you as the researcher do not bring categories to the text. Rather, you read the text, you spend some time, some feelings with it, and look for patterns and create categories based on what looks most important or most prominent in the text to you. Most studies using inductive coding follow a procedure called grounded theory. This procedure is the focus of uh, this presentation. It's hard to overstate how influential grounded theory has been. It's really important. In fact, almost all qualitative research in tourism and leisure these days uses grounded theory as a method for analyzing text data. Anytime a paper reports that the researchers used constant comparison, that they inductively or interpretively coded for themes, that they wrote memos while reading the text, or that they created distinct conceptual categories, they used something like grounded theory. They used a method that's developed or derived from the idea of grounded theory. First, we're going to look at what grounded theory means, where it came from, and then we're going to do it together uh, a couple of times. Grounded theory comes from a study of dying that was conducted in the 1960s by two researchers named Glazer and Strauss. What Glazer and Strauss wanted to know was how the relationships among doctors, patients, and family developed as patients got closer to dying. So if we're thinking in terms of independent and dependent variables here, the independent variable was time, how much time people had left before they died, and the dependent variable was their relationships with family and doctors. Glazer and Strauss interviewed people about their dying processes, and they wrote two books. One was about their findings, the awareness of dying, 1965, and the other book they wrote was about this brilliant new approach that they took to conducting and analyzing uh, the text of their interviews. And this one was called the, the Discovery of Grounded Theory. Later, Glazer and Strauss broke up as researchers. They got, they got in an argument and stopped working together. They got in an argument about what grounded theory was really all about. That's why these days people prefer to say other things about their analysis than to say that we used grounded theory. People are shy to use grounded theory because it could be referring um, to more recent ideas from Glazer that are far more radical and let's say not quite as logical as the original 1967, 1973 grounded theory. No matter what anyone tells you, though, almost all inductive coding that you see these days is based on some variety of the procedures from this 1967 book. So what does it mean? What does grounded theory actually mean? First, it's worth to talk about what theory means. Theory is an explanation. It's an answer to the question why. It is a statement in, uh, let's say, in more um, positivist research. It's a statement about how an independent variable affects a dependent variable. But in any case, it's an explanation or story about how things happen. So that's theory. Let's see what grounded means. Here's something like a dictionary definition. Grounded means placed on a foundation, fixed, based on something. So grounded theory involves making a theory that is solidly built, that is built on a solid foundation. That foundation, friends, is the data, the text, what people actually say. What people say is the foundation of grounded theory. So grounded theory is grounded in the words of the participants, in the data. 
Grounded theory has three steps. They may have different names, and some of the steps might be a little bit different generally, but more or less, again, any research that uses grounded theory goes through some form of these three steps. So now we're going to learn grounded theory by doing it, by doing these three steps. We're going to code a bit of text from a blog about mountain biking. Our research question for um, this particular bit of analysis is, what are the benefits of a mountain biking holiday? In other words, when people go mountain biking, what do they get out of it? So here we have a bit of a uh, text about a mountain biking holiday. So first let's read it. I hopped up and tried to dust myself off as Chuck rolled up behind me asking, Dude, are you okay? I saw a good amount of blood pouring from my arm and headed for the medics. Initial examination produced the comment, that's a nice puncture you've got there. After a 10 minute visit, including plenty of sterile water, hydrogen peroxide, and bandages, I limped back to the salsa tent and returned the bike. I explained to Bobby and crew what had happened and they offered me up a cold, fat tire amber ale. So the first step, to doing grounded theory. It's called open coding. Uh, what this first step involves is to just summarize the, the sentences and the parts of sentences that we found most interesting or most relevant uh, using so-called open codes. And open codes are uh, really just shorthand for what about something someone said you found interesting? So we're really just summarizing here. So go through this again and think to yourself, okay, what is it here for the benefits of the mountain biking holiday that we really find interesting? And how can we summarize it? Not the whole paragraph, but kind of one idea, one sentence, or part of a sentence at a time. So here's my open coding of the mountain biking text. Okay, I hopped up and tried to dust myself off. That's moving with injury for me. And Chuck rolled up behind me asking, dude, are you okay? Called that friend asking if he's okay. I saw a good amount of blood pouring from my arm and headed for the medics. I call that finds injury serious. Then the next couple of sentences I didn't find particularly interesting, but I notice he mentions I limp back to the salsa tent, and that looks to me again like moving with injury. Then he returned the bike. I explained to Bobby and the crew what had happened. So he's explaining to a friend, and they offered me up a cold fat tire amber ale. So friend gives him a beer. That's that's the end of the passage. So this is my open coding of this paragraph, and these are all open codes. You can see I had one code, moving with injury, that occurred twice. Uh, then I coded the place where he found his injury serious, and all these other codes uh, had to do with interactions with friends, and they occurred only once. When you do open coding, you should move quickly through the text. Just summarize anything you find interesting in a very straightforward way. Leave the rest behind. It's important to, as Strauss and Glazer might say, to stay close to the text while open coding. This means summarizing without adding your own interpretation. You can see I'm not interpreting a lot in the text. I'm really just giving sort of shallow names or, or summaries for each part that uh, looks, looks important to me. The idea at this stage is not to interpret what people are saying, but just to reduce it, to go from the, let's say, larger amount of text that we have here to a smaller amount of text that we can work with here. Interpretation happens later. 
my open coding of this data has successfully removed the amount of text that we have to deal with. Notice how it's much quicker for us to look at this list of open codes and look for some kind of pattern, some kind of common ideas that look important, than to go through the paragraph and try to figure out what kinds of things are important to this participant. So now that we have this, have this nice list of short, meaningful text, we can do some interpretation. Specifically, we can look for patterns, ideas that seem to be important to this guy. I saw two patterns here. For one, I found that this tourist seemed to rather enjoy dealing with his injury. You know, he's sort of bragging about finding the injury serious. He's bragging about moving with this injury. He's, he's a little bit proud. Uh, and then uh, a number of interactions with his friends, like his friend asking if he's okay, explaining to a friend, friend giving him the beer. So these interactions with friends also seemed important to him. So the stage where we identify these patterns and give them a name we call focused coding. So in my focused coding, I coded the passages related to injury as dealing with injury and those related to interactions with friends as interacting with friends. Notice that these categories that we've created in focused coding, which are called themes, so these are our two themes, are clear, precise categories in the mind of our participant. They're not based on my preconceptions. They're not based on what I've read in the literature. They're really just based on what he's saying and how I, as a researcher, interpret his text. Now, we said in open coding, you move quickly and you don't interpret. In focused coding, you move slowly and you repeat what you're doing over and over again, thinking about what the themes are. You gradually make them better, make them more precise so they become clear and sharp. And here are a couple ideas for how you do that. Okay, so focused coding is a repetitive process of defining and clarifying your themes over and over again until you know exactly what each theme means. You should ask yourself several things about each theme as you develop them. First of all, ask if a theme is too narrow or too broad. Should it be divided or merged with others? If we read more blog posts about mountain biking, we might compare this theme of interacting with friends to other mentions of building or breaking relationships to see if the, the whole interacting with friends theme needs to be bigger or if there are different kinds of interactions that need to be turned into different themes. Second, ask yourself for a clear definition of what is and is not included in each theme. For example, so many things could be included in interacting with friends that maybe this theme is a bit vague, actually. One of my students pointed out that all the examples of interactions with friends in the text weren't just interactions with friends, they all involved friends caring for one another. So caring is in the theme. On the other hand, there were no negative interactions with friends, so negative interactions are out. And thus, we can refine this theme to caring interactions with friends. So interacting with friends becomes caring interactions with friends, and that's a better theme. It's more precise. Third, it's good to consider the complexity of each theme. Are there sub-themes that we have to also examine and define? For example, further reading might give us the idea that this participant is excited to get back on the bike after being injured. As I mentioned, he also seems to wear this injury with a bit of pride. So we might find that dealing with injury is a good theme, but that it's complex and it needs these sub-themes, resuming activity and pride, to be defined. With these considerations, we can finish our focused coding, have 
some themes that we're really happy with, that are good and clear, and move on to the last step, which is called theoretical coding. In theoretical coding, we conclude, often with a picture, how our themes are connected. While this is sort of a stupidly simple example, based on um, you know this, this short blog post, we can say that both of these things, dealing with injury and caring interactions with friends, are important benefits of the mountain biking holiday. When we make this connection, we accomplish three things. We connect the themes into a theory, a grounded theory, one that's grounded in the data. We answer our research questions, and we're able to make links between this grounded theory and other theories that we've discussed in our literature review. For example, our grounded theory is that dealing with injury and caring interactions with friends are important benefits of the mountain biking holiday. We might answer our research question, what are the benefits of a mountain biking holiday, quite directly now. Furthermore, we can link this finding to previous research on the benefits of outdoor recreation, which has not examined mountain biking. We can say that these findings extend the framework of driver and colleagues from 1999 to include dangers such as injuries among the benefits of outdoor recreation experiences. So that would add to theory that we discussed in the literature review. Okay, now I would like to try um, grounded theory coding again, but this time I'm going to uh, start from, from a text that I have read, but I have not coded yet, so we're going to code this together. I would like for you to think with me if you agree with the way that I have um, open, focused, and theoretical coded this, uh, this particular text, or if you can come up with a way to, um, let, let's say, a, a set of open codes and focused codes themes and a theory that is more precise or you think better represents what this participant is trying to say. So I have an example of a text about windsurfing. And this text is based on the research question, when someone starts an activity like windsurfing, what causes them to become more involved? What causes someone to get really into something like windsurfing? So we're going to code it together now, and I'm hoping that uh, you see not only sort of how I do this process and imagine how you can do it, but also so that you can see some of the mechanics of how, you know, we can, we can manage our codes in a program like Microsoft Word. All right. So here's our, here's our text. It's called Until I Was 13. Let's... Um, it's, it's still, it's a little bit longer than the blog post, but it's still pretty short. So let's first read it together. Until I was 13, I went for three weeks every year to Greek summer camp. When I turned 14, I was no longer eligible to go for free, so instead my parents allowed me to go to a Dutch summer camp for a week. I was free to pick the theme, and I, I wanted, and I picked a windsurfing camp. Why? I can't remember. This first week of windsurfing camp was terrible. Getting on a windsurfing board is really hard. I fell all the time. It was really cold and windy. And since I spent eight or more hours a day in the water, I was feeling miserable. Despite this, I still thought it was really fun. I was really proud of myself when I finally managed to stand on the board and take it wherever I intended to. Well, almost. So obviously, next year I got to go again. Disappointingly, this time there wasn't as much wind, so it was much harder to learn something. Once you know how to windsurf, it's much easier to windsurf when there's wind. If there isn't wind, your mistakes do not get forgiven and you just fall. Fortunately, at the end of that summer, when we got back to Greece, my parents surprised me with my own windsurfing board. A very colorful, big rock and roll board with a matching five and a half square meter sail. We lived about an hour away from the beach, so from then on, each weekend, I was passionately monitoring the weather, trying to figure out if there would be wind that weekend. 
That year, my parents also replaced their trusted Toyota Corolla with a Toyota RAV4 4x4, small one. So we also stopped getting stuck in the beach sand all the time. Since I could windsurf year-round, I got much better at it very quickly. I learned how to water start. Instead of getting on the board first and then lifting the sail out, by water starting, you lift the sail a bit out of the water and let the wind lift it further and you with it. It requires using a bigger sail, one that can generate enough power to lift you out of the water as well. But by then, I was good enough that the bigger sail only made it easier to windsurf. I also learned planing. Yes, that's how you spell it. Planing is what happens to the board when you go fast, so fast the board comes out of the water and doesn't rub the water anymore. The board suddenly accelerates and you're flying across the water. The fin stays in the water and helps you go straight. It's an incredible feeling. I also learned how to jibe. A jibe is a turn during which you don't lose speed and hence keep planing through the turn. It's pretty hard to do, so it entailed a lot of falling in the beginning, but I got better as the year progressed. By that time, I had also gotten stronger from all the swimming and windsurfing, so I could use a sail as big as the ones the boys were using. Being lighter than them, it meant I could go faster. And trust me, there's nothing more satisfying than being a better or even faster windsurfing than a bunch of macho Greek men. Okay, very, very interesting and rich bit of text. Now, some of this text is, is a little off topic, so before we begin open coding, let's remind ourselves our research question is what causes someone to get more involved in an activity like windsurfing? What causes them to get really into it? At the stage of open coding, we can quickly decide that the first part of the text actually um, isn't, isn't really relevant for us at all because uh, this, this person is telling us just about you know, starting out in windsurfing. And that's, that's not really what we want to know. What we want to know is how she got more into it. I think she starts talking about that. Um, let's say when, when she went to the camp the second time. So the first thing I'm going to do in open coding is to say, you know, I'm not going to worry about all this text. I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to code it at all. Maybe, maybe we'll come back to it later, but it doesn't seem to be very relevant. So I'll turn it gray. Then we can start start open coding here. Again, open coding is about um, sort of quickly moving through the text and summarizing the parts that we find interesting. And we have to write our open code somewhere. We could write them into the text, but I think in Microsoft Word it's really nice to open up the reviewing toolbar and use the comment function to open code. So view toolbars reviewing okay there's a button for insert comment I'm gonna hit that button whenever I see anything interesting and I'll type an open code all right so back to the text so obviously the next year I got to go again this time there wasn't as much wind so it was much harder to learn something learning something seems important so just going to code that as learning. Once you know how to windsurf, it's much easier to windsurf when there's wind. Call it easier with wind. If there isn't wind, your mistakes do not get forgiven, and you just fall. Falling. And clearly falling is not something you want to do, so I'll, I'll add that there's something negative about falling. Fortunately, at the end of that summer, when we got back to Greece, my parents surprised me with my own windsurfing board. Very colorful. Yeah, so on. Okay. This is, this is important. Parents bought her a board. 
We lived about an hour away from the beach, so from then on, each weekend I was passionately monitoring the weather, trying to figure out if there would be wind that weekend. Okay, there are two things going on here that seem important. Lived one hour from the beach, and this, this sort of passionately monitoring the weather. That's that's a that's a nice that's a nice quote. Passionately monitoring the weather, um, and that's also about wind, which which she mentioned earlier. But here she's saying something a little bit different about the wind. Um, so we can call it maybe monitoring for, or just even more simply, watching for wind. Okay. That year, my parents also replaced their trusty Toyota Corolla with a Toyota RAV4, so we stopped getting stuck in the beach sand all the time. So, what can we call this? Um, new car. Mm. New car did not get stuck on the beach. Since I could windsurf year round, I got much better at it very quickly. Okay, that seems like one idea, but I'm going to open code that separately. Um, could windsurf year round and got much better at it very quickly. Call that fast improvement. Learn how to water start. Okay. That's that's important. We don't we we can pretty much just use what she said there as the open code. That's called an in vivo code. Learn how to water start. Mm, then she's describing water starting. That doesn't that doesn't really tell us how she got more into it. So we're just gonna we're just gonna skip that. Requires using a bigger sail. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this means she got a bigger sale, but maybe we can make a tentative note about that, like got a bigger sale, maybe. This was an interview, let's say, we could always call her up on the phone, ask her later, what, what did you mean? By then I was good enough that the bigger sale only made it easier to windsurf. Okay, it really does sound like she got a bigger sale. Bigger sale made it easier. <clears throat> also learned planing. So, learned planing. Another explanation of planing and then she says that it's an incredible feeling whenever you have feelings or, or emotions it's it's usually going to be related to something you're looking for maybe i just think that because i'm an emotion researcher but okay this this looks important incredible feeling learn how to jive Explanation of jibing. Okay, it's pretty hard, so it entailed a lot of falling in the beginning. Maybe pretty hard? That's that's interesting because that means that something is challenging her. So we can we can code that as challenge. Entailed a lot of falling in the beginning. Again, we have falling, and again, it seems a little negative. But she got better as the year progressed. That's that's kind of um, maybe not fast improvement, but certainly improvement. Okay. 
improvement. By that time, I had gotten stronger from swimming and windsurfing. So, we got stronger. So I can use a sail as big as the one the boys were using. Being lighter than them meant that I could go faster. There's nothing more satisfying than being a faster windsurfer than a bunch of macho Greek men. Okay, that, that last part seems full of meaning, but it's kind of hard to pick apart. Um, so again, she's, she's saying something about, about using a large or larger sail. Uh, she's talking about um, going faster. There's also an idea of improvement there, but she doesn't say improvement. I got better. She said, I got faster. So let's code close to the text. Let's say going faster. And finally, she was she says well that it was it was satisfying to be better than a bunch of macho Greek men. So let's call that uh, out competing men. Okay. I'm gonna hit save. All right, so in, in a few minutes, we've, we've gone through this page of text, and we've open-coded a bunch of stuff that seems relevant to, um, to this, this teenage girl's progress or involvement in windsurfing. So let's read the open codes and see what kind of themes there might be. The, the open codes are learning, easier with wind, falling, negative. Parents bought her a board. Lived one hour from beach, watching for wind, new car did not get stuck on beach, could windsurf year round, fast improvement, learned how to water start, got a bigger sail, bigger sail made it easier, learned planing, incredible feeling, learned how to jive, challenge, falling negative, improvement, got stronger, out competing men. Okay. Now we have to focus code. We have to think about what what kinds of um, ideas uh, exist in her mind behind these statements that she's making about becoming more involved in windsurfing. We have to resist the temptation to somehow use all of the open or put all of the open codes into categories. We have to pursue the stuff that seems most interesting or most promising to us. And I see, I think, let's say three or four patterns here. There's definitely something about learning that comes up over and over. She seems to be learning new windsurfing skills. So I'm going to add to, to all the open codes that say something about learning. I'm going to turn on caps lock. And I'm going to add, um, let's say, a tentative theme that we're going to call learning skills. Okay, watching for wind. Year round. Fast okay, learn how to water start. It's also learning skills. Got a bigger sound or something. It's learning, planning, learning skills. Incredible feeling. Skills. Challenge. Got stronger. Larger uh, sale. Never finished that one. 
going faster, out competing them. Okay. So, so these things that she said about learning do seem to hold together. A couple of times she mentions the wind. It's easier when there's wind, watching for the wind. But maybe it happens twice. The thing with wind doesn't seem to have a lot of depth, so maybe we'll leave that alone. Besides learning skills, the other thing that, that seems to come up over and over again, but it's maybe not, not as, um, let's say, tight a theme as learning skills is uh, her, her access or her circumstances. So she's talking about living an hour from the beach, parents buying her a board, new, new car that didn't get stuck on the beach, being able to windsurf year-round. So I'm going to code that as improved access. Improved access. This is also improved access. Insert here around this. That's also access. <laughs> Yeah, getting a bigger sale, that, that also, that's improved access to equipment in a way. Okay. So, these, both, both improving the access and learning skills are, seem to be like processes that she has to go through. And they're quite distinct from each other. So those are two pretty good themes. But now we have, we have things like fast improvement. Uh, there's falling, there's challenge, there's those sort of difficulties. And then there's improvements, getting stronger, outcompeting the men. Uh, so so she's, she's facing some challenges on the one hand, and then enjoying some accomplishments on the other hand. Let's see if we can make at least one more theme there. Now you start to appreciate how much thinking and how much revising this actually takes. But for now, in our limited time, let's come up with one more theme about the uh, accomplishments, okay? So here she's talking about fast improvement. Okay. We'll call that accomplishment. Or maybe improvement isn't about an accomplishment. It's not about an end state, but it's about progress. It's about getting better. So maybe we could call it progress. And, and it's it's not a negative progress, it's a positive progress. And you can see that's that's really kind of related to learning skills, but you know when she talks about learning how to plane and plane being an incredible feeling, one is about learning the skills, but having the incredible feeling, that's like a sign of progress. So for me that belongs in the positive progress category. Challenge, improvement. I got better as the year progressed. Wow, that's, that exemplifies positive progress. Using larger sale, going faster is positive progress. Progress, and then there's um, out-competing men, positive progress. Okay, just to show you a little technical thing in Microsoft Word, um, 
I know some students prefer rather than doing everything in the comments, they do open coding in the comments, and then they prefer to um, write the, the focused codes in the document itself. So we might, we might write um, positive progress. Uh, what else do we have? Learning skills and improved access. Skills, improved access. And then they uh, highlight each theme with a particular color, like yellow for positive progress, and then, then they go up into the text and they highlight the text that represents that theme, positive progress, in yellow. So you get a very colorful document at the end. And here, here you can't see it because the word displays the highlighting color under the comment color. But that's, that's just uh, another way to do it. It's your choice. I prefer to do everything in the comments. So, we've done open coding and we've, we've tried or made some initial steps in doing focused coding. We've generated these, these three themes. Positive progress, learning skills, and improved access. Now we have to do theoretical coding. We have to make a statement about how positive progress, learning skills, and improved access are related. And it seems to me that the way they're related is that, well, clearly improved access um, really helped her get practice and for her practice really made perfect. And learning new skills made it more fun. And together, this, this fun and this ability for her represent positive progress. So there, um, there are obviously a number of ways to, to formulate it, but um, we, we might say that uh, improved access and learning skills are the requirements, they're the conditions in which she was able to make positive progress. So to put this in a really straightforward way, that maybe oversimplifies the truth, uh, but, but at least makes it clear, uh, we might say that um, improved access and learning skills made positive progress happen. Okay? And this would answer our research question. This would suggest that, okay, what, what a person needs to uh, get more involved in an activity is they need improved access and they need to learn some skills. And when they do that, they're going to measure how much more they're getting involved by looking for positive progress. And often when we theoretical code, um, we also make a visual model that shows the themes. Let me see if I can, um, if I can do that here. No, I don't think I want that. Let's try by viewing the drawing toolbar. Oop, right there. So we're going to have a rectangle that will, let's see if we can get our sentence up here, that would be nice. All right, so let's see if we can make this rectangle um, 
represent uh, improved access, for example. Improved access. Okay. Let me get rid of the rectangle. And that text box is enough. Okay. And we'll make another box that will say learning skills. Then we have positive progress, which is sort of our outcome. And if I'm really handy, I'm going to be able to make two arrows to connect. All right, super. Very simple version of theoretical coding. To make it look beautiful is up to you, but I hope that at this point you, uh, you have an appreciation for how uh, coding data in the form of text involves putting the interesting parts of the text into categories and how to use a grounded theory approach to do that for some of the text that you have. Till next time.